can we, as we always try to recognize them, can we just thank our Children's Church volunteers and our singers and all those volunteers this morning? And one person that, uh, that seems to get overlooked, and this is, uh, this is because of my fault, but this person helps keep this whole show running, and you hardly ever see him, but that's Brother David back there in the sound booth. Can we give him... Bless his heart, he's the one that every time something goes wrong, my neck switches back and looks at him. So he gets all sorts of looks, and sometimes he just has to throw his hands up and say, I'm not sure what that was. So y'all let everybody know how much you appreciate them. Are you happy to be in church this morning? Amen. I'm glad that you're glad to be here because I always love being in church, and um, it's always such a joy. Um, even on the weeks where I struggle to find what to bring to you, I just, I know I don't have to be worried because I know you're just here to receive encouragement and it doesn't matter how sloppy or how, how elementary I preach, you, you always do well encouraging me and you receive the word with gladness and that, that does a pastor's heart well and um, I, just want, I just want to brag on you for being such a good church. Last weekend when we were gone, uh, people asked us how the church was doing and I told them, I said, we could not have asked for a better first church. And um, we, we just love you and we appreciate you and I'm happy to be your pastor. And Taylor's happy to be your pastor's wife. Uh, we're glad to serve you. Uh, but this morning, and I'm going to continue on a thought that we've been talking about for the past, uh, this would be three weeks now. I missed last week, but this would be week number three. And I told you that I, I, I've kind of been on this, this mindset, been on this subject because of the month that we're in. Uh, next sun, not next Sunday, but a week from tomorrow, uh, we will, uh, Halloween will be celebrated by many and people will be dressing up. And yes, Taylor and I will be outside the parsonage giving out good candy bars just so the kids know. Uh, we want to see their little outfits and, you know, they always bring such joy to us until next year when we have our own. So then we're coming to your house. House. <laughs> and we expect some candy from you. So, uh, uh, but, we, you know, we, we have all this stuff going on and in the midst of all the fun and things of that nature, uh, there's also a great deal of spiritual warfare going on. Uh, the church of Satan is fasting heavily. Uh, the witches, the Wiccans, uh, they're also fasting. They're doing all their spells and all this demonic activity is going on. And, and whether you realize it or not, it's affecting all of us because do you know that there are witches and there are Satanists who, um, who believe, and who probably do, uh, who, who believe they have power to send spirits against people and to attack people and to attack churches. Do you know that? Do you know that there are the church of Satan, the Wiccans, they are sending out demonic spirits or they are sending out ministering spirits as some of them call against the church of Jesus Christ because they hate us. We are their enemy. There, there are worldly spirits seeking to destroy you every day. Do you realize that if God gave you spiritual eyes to see what was going on around you, you would probably be terrified? Yeah. Because every time you walk even into this church, I'm not saying they're here now, but there are, there are evil spirits around you constantly trying to deter you from the work of God, trying to keep you from coming to church, trying to keep you from reading your word. There are demonic spirits targeting you every day to keep you in bondage and to keep you in fear. But the past three weeks, I've been trying to remind you that we don't have to be afraid because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We don't have to live as slaves to fear or anxiety or depression because greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world. Greater is the power that is within me than the powers of darkness. It doesn't matter how strong the demonic stronghold is. It doesn't matter how powerful that evil spirit is. You have have a greater power, you have a greater authority, and we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of God who have the authority and the ability to cast things down and walk in freedom and in liberty in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. 
I've been trying to encourage the saints because the Bible says, and I'm just, I'm just preaching off the hip. Is that okay? Is that okay? I got 10 pages worth of notes we may not even get through today. But because I'm, I, I've dealt with this all week, can I tell you that the spirit of fear and that the kingdom of darkness has been heavily against me because I've been helping expose some things in some people's lives. And some of you have been walking in freedom. You've been walking in a liberty you've never experienced, not because of me, but because of the word and because of the word is going forth the enemy is attacking but I'm here to put the enemy on notice today he can attack me all he wants I'm not going to shut up I'm not going to shut down because I am looking forward to the people of God finishing this race with strength and with encouragement because we are not defeated we win in the end come on give the Lord some praise but the Bible says in Daniel that the spirit of Antichrist would seek to wear out the saints of the Most High. He wants to wear us out. How does he do that? The mind. Fear. Fear is the way that he wears us out. Fear of the economy. Fear of the election. Fear of our job. Fear of other people. Fear, 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 fear. The enemy trying to instill fear because he knows if we will be afraid, then we won't walk in the destiny and in the calling and in the fullness of power that God has for us. But the past three weeks I've been seeking to help you understand we can overcome fear. And today I'm going to sum all that up with just a simple title, Overcoming Fear. And we're going to read a scripture that I have kind of skirted around and I've kind of mentioned here and there, but I've not delved into it deeply. But today we're going to go directly into that scripture. Get your Bibles and go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and we're going to read one verse and it'll be on the screen for you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 and it simply says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Let's read that together one more time. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Father, I thank you for the word of God that goes forth with power and great anointing. And I pray today that I will be the vessel and I will be the spokesman who is able to do that today, Lord. Lord, today anoint me and anoint my words. Let it be your words and not my words. Let it be your thoughts and not my thoughts. And Lord, today continue to break the bondage of fear off of people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul has written this letter to Timothy. This is the second letter that Paul has written to Timothy. And when you read the first few verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1, you will find that Paul has the intention of encouraging and instilling some hope into his young protege, Timothy. Now, it's always good to get encouragement. It's always good to get some, some letters that are telling you you can make it, you can overcome. But there's a specific reason why Paul wrote this letter of encouragement. And if you read 1 Timothy, you will find out that, that Timothy was pastoring the church of Ephesus. And as he's pastoring this great church, he's got a lot of difficult situations, a lot of difficult scenarios, Misty, that he's facing. And it's cause, causing him to be burdened and overwhelmed. When you read the book of 1 Timothy, you will find that Timothy was facing these sort of situations. In 1 Timothy 4, it says that he was being despised for his youth. Timothy was about 30 years old, but in that, in that culture of that day, somebody was not considered to be mature or to be an adult until they hit 40. So all you 40 and belows, aren't you grateful for that? We're still considered youth in Jesus' name. <laughs> But the church, because of that culture, they despised Timothy's youth. Basically, they were disrespecting him and was not respecting his authority and his position as pastor because they did not see him as mature enough or equipped enough to lead the church. Another thing he was facing is he was facing false teachers. False teachers were in the church and they were trying to teach another gospel. They were trying to teach different doctrine. And Timothy was having to, to teach the correct doctrine, to correct these false teachers. He had 
had feminists trying to overpower the church leadership and take over the church because in that in that area uh, Ephesus was the head of the worship of the Greek goddess Diana and because of that women had a had a sort of power in the pagan world and so they were trying to exert that same power in the church when God had not put them over the leadership of that church but there was feminist pagan women trying to overcome Timothy and trying to take over the church so they could have things their way. Uh, he also, godly leaders were hard to find in that area. A lot of these people that were converting were pagans and they weren't sanctified yet. They, they were being discipled and so Timothy was the only really godly leader in this area and so he's having to pastor this church while also go out and do evangelism and, and, and take care of people all by himself. So it was just Timothy, he was burnt out. Anybody ever been burnt out? I know how that feels sometimes. Sometimes the pastors, the weight of the world lays on them and they feel like they have nobody. That's how Timothy felt at this moment. The widow's ministry needed attention. I thought this was kind of funny because, not because of what was going on, just because of the way Paul wrote it. In that time, the older widows, their children were supposed to take care of them. But because the church had money to take care of the widows, the children said, oh, we'll just let the church take care of mama. And so they just kind of pushed mama over to the church and they were going and living their life while the church was being burdened with taking care of mama. And then the younger widows who were below 60, they decided, well, if the church is going to support the widows, I just won't work and I'll sit at home and they can support me. And it says that the younger widows were going around house to house gossiping and slandering and stirring up trouble. So Paul said, tell the women they need to sit down and be quiet in church. Now, women, don't get mad at me. He wasn't talking about you. He was talking about these women, okay? Let me differentiate from that. He was telling them they need to stop. He said, it's better for the older people, let their children take care of them. And he said, it's better for the younger ones to get married. He said, let them marry because they can't be a burden to the church. There are some people that really need some help. But Timothy's having to go through all this. It said that the poor people of the church were being greedy and the wealthy weren't giving up any money. They had wealthy people in the church who didn't want to tithe because they were afraid that the, that the poor people who were greedy were going to get so much money that they were going to overpower the wealthy people. And to top that all off, the church was being persecuted and Timothy was a target because he was pastoring a mega church in Ephesus. And to make it even worse, his mentor Paul is in a jail cell about to be executed. So Timothy had a lot of things on his mind. He was overwhelmed, he was overworked, underappreciated, and he was burnt out. And all these things that were going on in Timothy's mind and in Timothy's life were obviously causing him to suffer with a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear. All the, he, he didn't know what was going to happen next, Sister Sandy. He didn't know the weight of the ministry, the weight of life, the weight of all these things were just coming down on him, Brother Gene. And there was a fear on him because the future didn't look real hopeful. You ever been there where the future just did not look real hopeful? There was not a light at the end of your tunnel. You saw the tunnel, but all it was was darkness. Hello, help me preach this morning. The more you help me preach, the faster we get through this. Timothy was overburdened. He was overwhelmed. He was burned out. And all these worries, all these concerns were causing him to deal with a spirit of timidity, a spirit of cowardice, a spirit of fear. And he was shutting down and obviously Timothy was considering quitting the ministry because if you continue to read on in 2 Timothy, Paul tells him to remain steadfast. He said, remain steadfast under trial. Basically, Timothy, don't give up. And so Paul's writing this and he, he takes that first seven verses to encourage him. And in verse seven, he tells them that he's going to be victorious because he says, God has not given you this spirit of fear, but he's given you power. He's given you love and he's given you a sound mind. Now, when you read this, you may think that this is just for Timothy. But honestly, as we know, the Bible is for correction and doctrine and for an example for us. Do you believe that? So while it was written to Timothy, God's trying to tell me and you something too. And I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me just go ahead and make this statement in case I forget to. You may be going through something this morning. 
Your situation may look hopeless. Your problem may be overwhelming. Your problem may be threatening. Your problem may be a giant of a situation that you don't see any hope for. And you may be timid. You may be afraid. You may be anxious. And you may be overwhelmed. But God wants you to know you don't have to be fearful. Because greater is He who is in you than he who is in this world. And you don't have to be a bondage to fear and to anxiety because you have been given the power and the love and the sound mind to overcome it. Paul's writing to Timothy and he's telling him all this that you're going through this is not from God. There's two things Paul first emphasizes that first thing is this spirit of fear you're facing it's not from God. God did not put this on you. This timidity, this timidity, this cowardice, this fear, this anxiety, it's not from the Lord. Now, we all know the quote from Franklin Roosevelt that says, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's a good quote, but it's, it's not really, it's not, not as sound as we'd like it to be because let's be honest, there is such a thing as good fear. Give me an example, Drake. Well, I am terrified of snakes. That's why when people say, are you a snake Canlan church? I said, no, because I wouldn't pastor it if we were. <laughs> and for good reason. It's because I'm not afraid of the snake itself, but I'm afraid of what the snake can do to me. That's a natural fear, okay? A natural, when you say you're afraid of heights, you're not afraid of heights. You're afraid what could happen if you fell off the heights, you're afraid of the splat that would come after falling off a tall building. So we have natural fear. We need natural fear. And there's a fear of the Lord. That's a mighty respect for God. Okay, if you don't have a fear of the Lord, then you don't have wisdom. Because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a mighty respect for God. That's worshiping Him and putting Him in the right place in your life. But Paul says God did not give you the negative type of fear. Because this type of fear was keeping Timothy in a cowardly, anxious, overwhelmed mindset to the point that he wanted to give up. Now, how would it make sense if God tells us 365 times in the word, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. How would it make sense that God would give us a spirit of fear if he kept telling us to be strong and courageous and not be afraid? So... Paul was reminding Timothy, this fear, this feeling you have is not from God. And he follows it up with telling him where it is from. He says, God has not given you a spirit of fear. So many times we look at fear as an emotion, but fear is not an emotion, it is a spirit. Can I tell you that fear, that fear that you feel, that fear of, that, 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 that anxiety, that overwhelmed feeling, that dark mindset, that is an attack directly from Satan himself. Are you with me this morning? Fear is a demonic spirit who has been assigned to torment your mind. First Peter, I'm, I'm sorry, First John chapter 4 verse 18 says that fear involves torment. Fear is a tormenting spirit whose assignment is to harass and torment your mind to the point that you are anxious, you are worried, and you are overwhelmed, and you want to give up. Fear is a false prophetic spirit who tells you things so that you will become overwhelmed and that you and tells you things that cause you to fear and cause you to fear so much that you start switching fates. Remember in the first sermon, no longer a slave to fear, I told you fear is faith. It is just faith in the wrong thing. Are you with me this morning? Amen. I need a amen, oh me, oh my something. I need to know that you're listening to me. <laughs> Fear is faith. Fear is faith in the wrong thing. Fear is faith that what the enemy is telling you is true. Fear is faith that what, what you are afraid of is going to come to pass. Fear is faith in the fact that the enemy is stronger than God. 
That's what fear is. Fear wants you to switch faith. It wants to lie to you prophetically. It wants to falsely prophesy over your future. When fear tells you something's going to happen, it's trying to create a false prophecy in your life so you will believe it and begin to believe what it says over what God says. Fear's point, fear's purpose is to make you forgetful. How does it make you forgetful? If fear can overwhelm you enough, you'll forget the faithfulness of God. Am I talking to anybody this morning? When you are in fear, let's be honest, when you are in fear, your mind is so overwhelmed with the situation that you fail to remember that God has come through for you in the past. When you are in fear, you don't automatically revert to remembering about all the times God has shown up time and time again. You're only focused on the situation at hand. Fear wants to shut you down and the way that it shuts you down is by making you forget what God has done for you in the past. Some examples are when the, when, when the children of Israel were at the, they were at the brink of the promised land and, God, and Moses, I'm sorry, yeah, Moses sent 12 spies into the land and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, yeah, there's, there's all this stuff there, but we can take them. There's giants and there's, there, there's, there's strong armies, but we can take them. But then 10 others said, oh no, we can't do this because there's people there, they're so big, they make us look like grasshoppers. There's things, there's armies so mighty, they've got weapons that we never could have even dreamed of. And the whole congregation of Israel got in fear because of what 10 spies said over the other two and because they were in fear Israel was kept in the promised land 40 more years wandering in the wilderness never fulfilling their promise why because of fear another example we've talked about this already Israel's facing the Philistines and Goliath comes out and is taunting the people of God and he's using his loud boisterous voice and he's telling them, if you'll defeat me we'll serve you but if I defeat you you're going to serve us and they were terrified because of how big Goliath looked and because of fear they stayed on the other side of the valley and never charged after the enemy even though all Goliath was was a bully do you hear me this morning? Fear wants to make you forget the faithfulness of God. If fear can make you forgetful, then it can keep you in fear and in hopelessness. And it'll make you feel like there is no hope for your future. But my Bible says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not his benefits. Who forgives you of all thine iniquities, who heals you of all thine diseases who renews your youth like the eagles and who provides for you all the sustenance of your life. Listen to me this morning. Fear may want to make you forget but the way that you cause fear to retreat is you start recounting all the times God has shown up for you in the past. Amen. And if God's shown up for you this morning I want you to give him a hand clap of praise real quick. So Paul says God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's not giving you this spirit, but he's given you something else. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 and 6, I think it's up here. I think it's next, Brother David. Paul says, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you, stir up, say stir up. Stir up. stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul was in fear and was timid because he had forgotten, I'm sorry, Timothy was in fear and was timid because he had forgotten the things which God had instilled in him. Paul's reminding him, he's saying, God's been faithful to you in your past. He's been faithful to your grandmother. He's been faithful to your mother. He's been faithful to you. And he has instilled some spiritual gifts in your life. He has made a spiritual deposit in you that will help you overcome the situation that is at your door. Paul says, stir up the gift that is in you. 
Do you realize God has put in each and every one of us a divine gifting? Hello. He has put in each and every one of us a spiritual deposit that is able to overcome everything that this world and that the enemy throws against us. And just like Paul reminds Timothy, I want to remind you that we have within us the ability to defeat fear. We've just got to learn to stir it up and reactivate it in our lives. Paul says God has not given you the spirit of fear. And he finishes out and he says God has actually given you three giftings. Three to one. How many know three to one is always better? Come on. Three to one. He said, I've given you three, God's given you three other things so that you can confront this spirit. Three other spiritual giftings that will help you fight this battle. He says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. And I'm going to try to stay right here a little bit because there's a lot of information I want to give you. And I know the time and I'm going to try to get us out of here because we got to make a uh, trip up to Birmingham for a party. So pray for us. And uh, she's already said we got to go before one o'clock. We got to go before one o'clock. So I said you can't put a Pentecostal preacher on time restraints. But anyway, we'll try. Huh? We'll try. Yeah. Somebody pray for the preacher. Uh, he said, God has given you three other gifts, and these are three things that we have to overcome fear. Are you with me this morning? He said, the first one is power. He said, God has given you the spirit of power. Now, that word power should be very familiar to you because it's a word that Pentecostal preachers love to preach on a lot. Is that The word power is the word dunamis. It's the Greek word dunamis, and that word means energy. It means might. It means force or it means strength. It is actually the word that we get the word dynamite from. So it insinuates that dunamis is dynamic, explosive power. Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, Tarry in Jerusalem, for you shall receive power after that which the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the uttermost parts of the world. So, so dunamis is, is the ability to do something for God that you could not have done in your own strength. Dunamis is dynamic, explosive power, and it is a power, a supernatural ability to combat and overcome all obstacles of resistance. Luke 10, 19 says, and now you see, I have given you the power, the dunamis to tread underfoot snakes and scorpions and all forces of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. So Paul is telling Timothy, you have have the power within you to overcome the spirit of fear because this power that is in you is not a natural power but it is a supernatural ability. It is a power directly from the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit has given you divine, explosive, dynamic power that is able to overcome all the attacks and all of the things of the enemy. He said you have power from the Holy Spirit. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in me and is in you. That same power that caused Jesus to rebuke devils and raise blood, dead people from the dead is in me and in you. Paul said you have been given power through the Holy Spirit to overcome all the works of the devil. He said you have been given power you have been given divine authority. Can I tell you that that's one reason why we don't or why we live in such a spirit of fear and timidity is because we fail to realize that we have authority. Do you realize you have dominion? What is dominion, Brother Drake? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, when God created man in his own... I'm sorry, not Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 2, when God created man, it said that he had dominion over all the beasts of the field and all the things of this earth. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been, been given divine dominion over spiritual things. Why do you think the Scripture says we have power to call things not as though they were? Talk to me. 
Why do you think that the scripture says that we have power to rebuke devils, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to heal the blind, to heal the deaf, because we've been given divine authority and dominion. The Bible says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth to destroy all the works of the enemy. The same anointing that is on Jesus because he said, if I don't leave, the spirit won't come upon you. Because the spirit was totally on the Lord. But when Jesus left, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. And when the comforter comes upon you, he said, they will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents and will not be harmed. All these things will come against them, but because of divine authority, they will be able to demolish all the attacks of the enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're what? They're mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. You have the power within you to rebuke fear. You have the power, Sister Betty, when that fear comes on you and it tries to lie to you, you have the power through the Holy Spirit to say, fear, you're a liar. And I rebuke what you've just said and I refuse to receive the lies that you're trying to put on my life. When anxiety tries to come on your life, you have the authority, Misty, to say, my Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make my need made known unto God. And the peace of God will cover my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. Do you realize you have authority over all things of darkness, including the spirit of fear? If you would exercise your authority and dominion more, fear wouldn't have a place in your life. Am I making sense to anybody? You have power. He says you have been given power from on high. He says, you've been given a spirit of power. You've been given dynamic, supernatural ability to face whatever the enemy is throwing against you. You have the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead working inside of your life. The spirit of God is is working in you and is giving you the victory to overcome. See, we are more powerful than fear. Did you hear what I said? We are more powerful than fear. Fear thinks it has power, but fear only has the power that we give it. Oh, that hit somebody. Fear has power, but it only has the power that you give it. Fear only is able to exercise the dominion that you allow for it to have. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians, don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to any spiritual warfare because once you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You have power. Look at somebody and tell them you have power. You have power. Paul said, Timothy, you do not have to be afraid because the power that is in you is greater than the power that is in this world. The power that is in you is greater than the power of fear. He said, Timothy, you do not need to be afraid because you have the Holy Spirit. You do not need to be afraid because you have the power and the authority to overcome and to rebuke fear. See, the enemy wants to make us think we are powerless, but in reality, he's the powerless one. He's been stripped of all authority. It is us who have the authority. We've just got to learn to exercise it. We have been given power. The second thing is we have been given love. That that word love is agape. That's perfect love. There's three different kinds of love, and I won't go into them this morning, but agape is the highest form of love. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about agape love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love does not boast. It is not self-seeking. That's agape love. And if you want the most basic and most foundational definition for agape love, it is the perfect love of God. Paul says you've been given a spirit of fear and a spirit of agape, a spirit of love. Now, I'll be honest with you, Amber. This this was the point I struggled with all week because I'm thinking, now, God, how on earth does love help me overcome fear? Anybody ever thought that before? Don't leave me hanging by myself. How does love overcome fear? I love Taylor, but because I love her, that don't mean that I'm not fearful. Sometimes when I smart off to her, I do get fearful. (laughs) Just saying. Pregnancy strength's a whole nother thing. (laughs) 
All you men said amen. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble on the way to Birmingham. <laughs> but my thought was, how does love overcome fear? And it finally dawned on me that again, it's not, that I, it's not just because that I love God, but it's because God loves me. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? The love that overcomes fear is not just my love for other people or my love for God because my love for other people and my love for God is still imperfect. But God's love for me and, my, and God's love for you is perfect. It's perfect because there is no self-seeking motivation in God's love. You know that God died for you just hoping that you would serve Him? The Bible says that while yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. He died with the hope that you would receive Him. He, he said, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whomsoever, anybody is a whomsoever, but not everybody accepts it. But the love of God says, even if they despise me and they hate me, I still love them enough to die for them. The love that Paul's talking about here is the perfect love of God. And 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 says that perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Now how does God's perfect love cast out our fear? Best illustration I can give you is those of you in here are parents have experienced this. When your children start sleeping in their own bedrooms... There comes times where they get afraid. Storms happen. They have a nightmare. Something wakes them up and, it, and, the, and they're afraid of the dark, whatever. And when they wake up, they're terrified. And either they holler for you and you come to their room or they get up and they run to your bed. And either way it goes, they, they get a mama's or daddy's attention. And they want mama or daddy to get in the bed with them. And when mom and daddy get in the bed with them and they hug them up or they rock them or they, they sing to them or they pet them, they somehow or whatever they do, whatever you do, you soothe them enough that all of a sudden they get calm, they're not crying anymore, and they start falling back to sleep. Your perfect love for them has cast their fear out. The situation hadn't changed. It's still dark. It's still storming outside. They still had a nightmare. But because of your love for your children, they're no longer afraid because they know that mama or daddy has them in their arms and they don't have to be afraid because nobody will harm them if mama or daddy is holding them. The way perfect love, and I feel the Holy Spirit right now, the way perfect love cast out fear is not knowing, that is not, is not realizing that, it's not focusing on you serving God, but it's on the fact that God loves you so much and that if God loves you, you don't have to be afraid of anything because if, if God loves you, that means God is for you. And if God is for you, that means nothing can be against you. And if, if that means nothing can be against you. That means the weapon may be formed but it will not prosper because God my Father loves me enough and He will protect me from all the attacks of the enemy. Give Him praise this morning. God's love does what a parent's love does for a child. It remute, excuse, excuse me. It removes insecurity and instills confidence. David said, through you, I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. Through God, all things are possible to those that believe. Not just because of power, but because we believe that God loves us enough that no matter what we're facing, it cannot prosper against us because God's a good father who protects his children. Let me say one thing. This, this really weighed on me. We want to always talk about God is for us, but yet when we face a trial or a situation, we start worrying about how we're going to get provision through it. We say we love God and God loves us, but yet when we struggle, 
We forget the love of God, and I know we forget the love of God because we start worrying, where's the finances going to come from? How are we going to eat? How are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to do this, 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 and this? But let me ask you, do your children ever worry about how you're going to provide for them? Jessica, does, Z does, does Xander and Zane wake up every morning and say, Mama, are you going to feed us today? Are you going to give us clothes today? Are you going to protect us today? No, they know you love them enough that it's an automatic thing. How much more would God provide and God take care of his children when it says how great of a love has God lavished on us that we should be called children of God? He said in Matthew chapter 7, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven know how to give good things to you? Amen. Let me tell you something this morning. You may be facing a hellacious situation this morning, but you don't have to worry about how you're going to get through. You don't have to be in fear because God loves you enough that he's going to make a way and he's going to give you what you need because he's a good, good father. The love of God should cast out our fear because we know no matter the storm raging, no matter the darkness around us, no matter what fear is trying to speak into our mind, we can have confidence that we are more than overcomers because our Father loves us. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4.18 goes, goes on to say, if somebody has not been perfected in love, then you don't know God. See, a lot of people struggle because they don't understand the love of God. Come on. A lot of people have been saved for years, but they still have yet to comprehend the true, unadulterated, pure love of God. He loves you even when you don't love Him. Yeah. Hello. The Bible says he is faithful when we are faithless. Even when we are wandering from him, Misty, his divine protection is keeping us because he loves you enough. Some of you should have died when you were in sin. Some of you were drug addicts that should have overdosed time and time again. But because of the sovereign love and sovereign grace of God, he kept you. Some of you were living a, a lifestyle of adultery and fornication and utter sin and you should have lost your family. You should have gotten an STD and died. You should have been in jail. But because of the sovereign love and the sovereign grace of God, he kept you. Some of you were living the most vilest life full of, 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 of alcoholism and you were mean and you should have been beaten up. You should have been where some of these murderers are in jail with nothing. But because of the sovereign love of God, that's how much God loved you. He brought you here. Even in your wondering. Even in your sin, God's love, whether you realize it or not, was nudging you. The conviction of the Holy Ghost kept you from going too far. Can I get somebody to just lift their hands and thank God for His love? Aren't you grateful for His love? Father, we thank you for, His love, for your love. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for your love. Hallelujah. Mm. Oh, just give him some more praise right now. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Hallelujah. Mm. I just feel the Lord telling somebody this morning. I feel it's a woman. He's telling you this morning that he loves you. You may feel like you're too far and you may feel like you have been in darkness too long, but he's telling you this morning he loves you and he sent you here this morning just so you could hear this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Paul said... God has given us the spirit of power and of love. Perfect love casts out fear. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't need to be afraid because God has us in his arms. The Bible says that nobody can pluck us from his hand. Nothing can take us out of his hand. We can walk out of it, but nobody can take us out. Fear may be lying to you and telling you there's no hope, but I have, I'm going to put fear on notice today. My God says I have hope because my Father takes good care of me. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. Amen. Paul says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power 
love, and the last thing is a sound mind. A sound mind. The word sound mind means sensible thinking. It means a saved mind, a delivered mind. It means a mind that is safe and secure and stable. A sound mind is a thought process based on the wisdom and clarity that God imparts rather than being manipulated by circumstances. So what is a sound mind? Basic form, a sound mind is a mind that is not driven by emotion or circumstances. Can I tell you in this world and in this church, there's a lot of us who are driven by circumstances and by emotions. Yeah. How do I know? Because how you respond to what's going on. Too many of us, and I'll include myself in this mix, when something bad happens, we want to sit down and we want to start worrying. Oh God, I don't know what we're going to do. Oh God, I don't know how we're going to get out of this one. Oh God, I, what are we going to do about the, 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 the kids' school? What are we going to do about the car payment? What are we going to do about this? Oh God, I don't see how we're going to get out of this. And we start, we start being overwhelmed by our emotions and we start making quick decisions. Anybody ever made a decision based off of emotion that you regretted later? Come on. That's why I say never make permanent decisions based off of temporary circumstances. Never make a permanent decision based off of temporary circumstances because the circumstance will end, but your decision will last. See, so often we allow our emotions to override our senses and our, and our logic and we start making decisions based off of emotion, not realizing we're making our situation worse. But see, a person who has a sound mind doesn't react that way. A person with a sound mind is somebody, you ever seen those people that, it, that a hurricane could be tearing up their neighborhood and they're sitting on their couch calm, cool, and collected? I can't stand people like that, in case you're wondering. People that no matter what's going on around them, they just don't seem to be bothered. They don't seem to worry. Why? Because most of them have what we call a sound mind. Their emotions don't drive their decisions. No. Their emotions don't dictate what they do. See, emotions are poor custodians of truth. Emotions are, are poor custodians of truth. Ever heard somebody when they got mad, they said all they saw was red? You ever heard that? That's because emotion, anger, blinds real perception. You ever been mad at somebody and they said something and you heard one thing but they really said another? Your emotions. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Come on. Emotions were driving your perception, but a sound mind, Paul said, is a mind that is not dictated by circumstance. It's not dictated by emotion. It's not dictated by what's going on around you, but it is a mindset that is stable, a mindset that is saved, a mindset that is steady and does not do illogical things because it is fixated on one thing, and that's the Word of God. Can I tell you that if you have an unsound mind, that's a, poor, that's a pretty good indication you don't spend time in the Word like you need to. Amen, Brother Drake, that's good. Thank you all. Amen myself, since you won't do it for me. If you have an unstable, worrisome mind, that's a good indication you're not having time with the Father like you should be. Why? Because the love of God, you see how it all connects? The love of God tells me I can be confident and the love of God reminds me I have power and therefore the power and the love give me a sound mind because I am sure of one thing that if God is for me, nothing can be against me. Therefore, I don't have to worry. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be in fear. I don't have to make quick emotional decisions because I'm sure that the promises of God are yes and amen. Men and I can trust in him and not myself. Amen. See, I, I said it a few minutes ago, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, for our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and pulling down strongholds and bringing every thought into captivity 
to the obedience of Christ. I talked about this probably in July about manning your mind. And I said, how do you cast down a thought? How do you bring a thought captive? You've got to create a wall with the word of God. Amen. A fortress is something that somebody can't get in, but also something can't get out. You see what I'm saying? Come on. Am I making sense? Come on, talk to me. Come on. Paul said we are to pull down strongholds, set, get ourselves free, but also when the fear and when the enemy comes to attack, we need to have a fortress built in our mind so that when that thought comes, we can hold it captive, Sister Teresa, because we've got the Word of God. The Bible says in Romans 12, verse 2, that we should not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. Paul's saying you don't do things like the world does. You have a different mindset. And the only way you can have a different mindset is by ingesting the Word of God and building a wall. Every thought you have, every decision you make should be based around the Word. You should be consulting the Word. The problem is <laughs> a lot of us don't consult the Word except for Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Come on. And we wonder why we struggle with anxiety, fear, depression. Come on. The Word of God, Hebrews 4, 12 says, The Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is able to differentiate between what is God and what is the flesh. When you know the Word of God, you know when a lie from the enemy comes. Because if the enemy comes and tells you, and he says, he says Tommy, you're never going to be healed. You're just going to die. You're, you're saying he's going to be left with nothing. Your grandchildren are going to be left with nothing, and you're just going to die, and nobody's going to even miss you. You have the Word in you that says, Devil, you're a liar, because my Bible says that by his stripes I am healed. When he looks at you and he says, Eddie, he said, this situation is going to take you over. You're going down. I'm taking everything from you. You've got the word of God that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. When you've got the word of God in your mind, you are able to cast down the lies of fear and keep a sound mind that is clear and free from emotion. Am I, did that make sense? I'm Misty, I'm almost done. You can go ahead. Paul said to Timothy, God has given you a sound mind, a stable mind, a mind that is not led astray by every illogical thought, by everything that comes in. You ever seen somebody that's just led, that they just, they just act on impulse constantly? Paul said, that's not, you're not supposed to do that, Timothy. Don't react according to impulse. Don't react according to emotion. Keep a clear mind. A mind that is filled with the Word of God. A mind that is not overwhelmed by fear. A mind, he said in, I think it's Corinthians, we're to, we're to put on the mind of Christ. And the mind, Christ was never worried. He was never anxious. Why? Because he had the Word. The Word of God will lead you because the Bible says it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. If there's no light at the end of your tunnel, that's fine. You better get your flashlight out and start walking. Come on. You don't need a light at the end of the tunnel. All you need is that little leather-bound book. And you open it up and step by step, moment by moment, situation by situation, God will order your Amen. steps. Amen. Paul said we have not been given a spirit of fear. But we've been given a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound mind. Those three things together, not separate, not separate now. They've all got to be working in tandem. Ecclesiastes says a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. You need all three working together. And when you have those three working together, you have the power and the ability to rebuke fear and refuse to live a life of cowardice, of anxiety, and depression. So this morning, Brother David, you can go ahead and stop.